So uh, yeah, welcome everyone to to my talk, and uh, I'm quite happy that so many people joined this event prior to my actual defense. And originally, it was planned that we only invite a couple of people, um, but now I see that uh, at least almost 30 people signed up for this presentation, so that's quite nice. And I I actually hope that. Uh, some of the content I'm going to present will be interesting for you for your own research or maybe also if you're from the industry for your actual product that you're developing. A few words about the content of this presentation. So although most of you are familiar with the technology, I will quickly explain what Airborne Wind Energy is and also motivate a bit my own research. I will then talk about flight guidance and robust attitude control systems for AWE systems and also how I think would be a way to verify and characterize their robustness uh, properties. And then in the last part of the actual presentation, I will talk a bit about the last chapter of my dissertation, where I present a framework that you can use to systematically find failure conditions or conditions that lead to a control system failure in order to learn from these failure conditions so that you can predict them in flight and eventually also prevent them. And then, as Roland already mentioned, there will be a Q&A session, which will last also about uh, 20 minutes, half an hour, depending on how many questions you have. And of course, you can also ask questions about the dissertation itself. If you had a look already at uh, the PDF that you could download from uh, via the link that we sent also in the invitation. So what's Airborne Wind? Well, or what are we trying to achieve here? We basically build or simulate flying systems that are connected to the ground with a strong tether. And we're trying to make wind resources accessible at altitudes that we cannot reach with conventional wind turbines, simply because you cannot build them um, several hundred meters uh, tall. And we are not restricted uh, with our flying aircraft or flying systems because uh, we, we don't need to support all the bending moments that a steel structure can can um, can can transmit, and one one advantage is that um, we need also much less material, so we don't need a large tower that is essentially not producing any energy, but we simply just use the part of the wind turbine that's actually producing the electricity, namely part of the tip of the of the blades, and we just connect them to a to a cable or a, a strong tether, and then. Uh, make these wind resources accessible by either transmitting the electricity through a conductive cable to the ground or by using so-called pumping cycle modes to um, periodically use the, the tension in the tether to reel out and reel in the cable from a winch and therefore turn a generator to produce the electricity on the ground. So how does a pumping cycle look like? For those of you who haven't seen it before, this is a computer simulation. So we distinguish between two operational phases. In the first operational phase, we are following a prescribed flight path, for instance, such a figure of eight shaped uh, pattern. And during this reeling out phase, we are turning the winch and the tether is reeled out. That's here indicated by the black line. And this essentially then transforms the mechanical torque into electrical power on the ground. At some point, of course, the maximum tether length is reached, which means you need to reset somehow the system by reeling the tether back in and the aircraft glides then back aerodynamically efficient to the ground station and then the whole cycle can start all over again. So if you see the systems flying, you will realize that this is quite a dynamic um, flight maneuver that you have to do with an aircraft that is built basically like a glider airplane, but you fly maneuvers that are very similar to uh, acrobatic airplanes or fighter aircraft. So this is, from a control perspective, of course, very challenging and also led to this research that I was uh, conducting for the past few years. All right, let's talk a bit about the flight control design. This is, for instance, an overview graphic of uh, one of the control architectures that I was developing in my thesis. Of course, since we are a bit limited in the time, I can only talk about specific parts of this control architecture. And in particular, I will quickly explain a bit the outer loop or the guidance loop, which is essentially the module that decides in which direction the aircraft needs to fly. And then also talk a little bit about the inner loop control system 
that controls the attitude angles of the aircraft and calculates the control service deflections to actually follow the commands coming from the guidance loop. I will also only focus on the traction phase because I think from a control perspective, this is also the more interesting phase. And if you're interested in uh, all the other parts and also a different architecture, you can also read this up in my, in my thesis. All right, so abstractly, here is a figure that I would like to use to explain a bit how the guidance loop works. So in the first step, you decide on a figure that you would like to fly. For instance, this figure of eight, which is lying on a virtual sphere. And what the guidance loop is doing, very similar to a conventional flight control system, it tries to steer the aircraft in this case, which is represented by this white dot, towards the, towards the flight path. If it's far away, we would like that the aircraft is intercepting the path perpendicularly. And the closer the aircraft gets to this, to this curve, the more curve aligned our tangential or our velocity vector projected onto this virtual sphere should be aligned with this tangential direction on the, on the curve itself. And once we are on this curve, then we would like to calculate the control commands that keep also the, that keep the aircraft on this path. And this is, for instance, now here depicted by this um, red dotted line where the aircraft was following this figure of eight um, accurately. The question, of course, now is how do you translate the, the kinematics now into actual control commands? And for that, of course, you need to look at the dynamics and not only the kinematics. So this means you need also to consider forces that are acting on your system. And for instance, what always is present, of course, is the weight of the aircraft, but you also can actually assign a specific tether tension that you would like to achieve with the flight controller. And of course, also a sentry pedal force that is used to create the maneuver force to follow this flight path. And it actually turns out that of this sentry pedal force is related to the rate with which this tangential plane uh, course angle changes. And this is also where you start to then de deriving your control law. And I tried to, on a very high level, explain this at, at the bottom of the slide. So you start with a mathematical curve and your kinematic velocity, which you measure, you calculate from there the required course rate that you need in order to follow this flight path. You choose a tether force that you would like to track, and then you can calculate simply by using the resultant force, the aerodynamic force that you then need uh, to track by the inner loop controller. Now, obviously, since the inner loop controller controls the orientation of the aircraft or the attitude, you need then also to extract from this desired aerodynamic force the angles that specify the orientation of the aerodynamic force, but also the magnitude of the aerodynamic force. And once you have these two angles, you basically reduce this problem of this path following problem in a simple attitude control problem. As in any control design, you should start by looking at specific characteristic operating conditions. Now, this is of course very challenging for this application because we are never standing still. We are always in motion. So specifying operating or stationary operating points is, is not possible, but you could define quasi-stationary operating conditions or points where you allow the aircraft from moving around, but without any accelerations. And in order to derive these equations, what I did is I did not simplify the dynamics beforehand, but I looked at the conventional six degree of freedom dynamics of the aircraft. And which basically means you have your translational equations of motion, you have your rotational equations of motion, which represent, especially on the kinematic level, the standard equations of motion of any free flying or also untethered aircraft. The difference, of course, is then in the force, uh, in, the, in the resultant force components and also in the result moment components, because there you get the contribution of the tether in the end. The more interesting part happens then in the attitude dynamics, because as I said before, if you are standing on the ground and you observe these systems flying, then you will realize that these systems are probably very hard to describe with linear models. And, but it turns actually out if instead parameterizing the attitude with respect to the ground, but with respect to a tangential plane, the variations of these attitude angles is much lower and much smaller. And then you can actually use this to justify the derivation of linear surrogate models, if you like, that you can use to describe the dynamics. And 
more, more, more specifically, you can define a set of Euler angles, very similar to the conventional Euler angle parameterization, or also quaternions, if you like, and can use then this new attitude parameterization to also reformulate your attitude propagation equation. The only difference to the conventional strap down equation is that you not only have your body rates of so the rates of the body fixed frame with respect to the northeast down frame, but you also have an additional so called transport rate that you need because you need to describe the the the, the, the movement of the tangential plane as the aircraft traces these flight patterns during the traction phase. And with these equations, you can then start to specifying your let's say optimization problem to derive your um, quasi stationary points. So as I said before, these quasi stationary points are characterized by an acceleration free flight state. And then you specify in addition to that several operating point conditions. The way I did this was I said I want to fly aerodynamic efficiently, so I specify a side slip angle of zero and then two operational conditions that specify a so-called power setting which means you want to fly at a certain angle of attack and you want to fly with a certain tension in the tether. And then if you want to linearize the system along different points on the flight path, you also need to specify actually the desired flight direction defined by uh, this angle he. And also since you would like to follow this curve, you also need to specify a um, yeah this rate, this, the rate that uh, specifies how this orientation needs to change in time. And then you can solve this problem and you solve it for the, all the other aircraft states that you did not specify and of course your control inputs. If you do this for several operating points, you can get these results here. So on the left, in the left figure, you see airspeed over angle of attack pairs for three different wind conditions. And one observation you can do here is actually that the wind condition is or the, the results for different wind conditions are the same. This is kind of also expected if you look at the fundamentals of crosswind flight, because the reeling speed is adapted, which means that you can counteract this change in wind speed by simply changing the radial velocity of your aircraft. This is maybe obvious for some people who are familiar with this, but it's very important for the control design process because it does not really make sense to design your controller for different wind conditions because if you design the controller in the way I design it, your, your, um, your operating points are invariant with respect to the wind conditions simply because of this adaption of the reading speed. All right, so once you have these operating point conditions um, specified and calculated, you can linearize your model around them and then you arrive um, at a set of state space models that you could then use for a further analysis or for the control system design. As a side note, it is important or it makes actually sense to pull out this tether force, which appears in this equation as an external input out of the input vector that you use later on to design your controller, because this is not the tether force, not a controlled input, and therefore it needs to be pulled out and yeah, specify, you specify then also an additional input matrix um, in the state space model representation. It turns actually out since you Reparameterize your attitude, you can also decouple your dynamics even further. So instead of designing a control later on of the complete state space model, you can also decouple the longitudinal and lateral, lateral dynamics in a very similar way you would do this for a conventional flight control design. And this is, I found this very interesting because I think it makes sense if, if a transport aircraft is flying in cruise flight conditions and you decouple the lateral and longitudinal dynamics, but it was not so obvious to me that you could also do this for crosswind flight. And you can actually also do a quick sanity check by, for instance, doing an eigenmode analysis. And what I did here, for instance, I plotted the eigenvalues of both the coupled models here indicated by the red, by the, by the blue circles and the longitudinal and lateral eigenvalues of the open loop system. And you can actually see that they are overlapping pretty well. You cannot distinguish them basically from each other. And that was kind of used for me, it was kind of a proof for me that this decoupling makes indeed sense. And also, of course, easiest than the control design process because you don't design the controller on a big system, but on two smaller subsystems with four states each. All right. So one, one other question that needs to be answered, of course, is once you grid your flight envelope, and you might then even want to associate 
to every operating point an additional robustness metric. So for instance, what I did is I calculated the structured singular value for each of these operating points to specify the robust stability properties of each of these controllers. But the real question here is, how big should you choose this flight envelopes? Or is there any way how you can actually better choose operating points that are more likely to be encountered during a pumping cycle? And this seems to be kind of like a chicken and egg problem because in order to figure out what airspeed angle of attack pairs you will encounter during a pumping cycle flight, you mean you also need already a controller for it, but in order to design a controller, you need to figure out where to design it. But due to this cascaded structure, you can actually start investigating the flight envelope or the expected flight envelope using simply your point mass dynamics. And as I said already before, since the outer loop calculates essentially the required aerodynamic force, you can simply use this already to fly complete pumping cycles and then identify the, the ranges of airspeed and angle of attack which you encounter during the traction phase. So in this example, the aircraft encountered airspeeds between 28 meters per second roughly and 34 meters per second and angles of attack between 5 and 10 degrees. Which means that you can then focus your attention really to a much smaller part of your flight envelope and design the controller that is very robust in this smaller area instead of having to design and cover a very large flight envelope. The open question now, of course, is what kind of controllers could you design? And I looked at very various different approaches in my thesis. One approach that led to a very um, robust performance and also robust stability properties and that were even very competitive to, the, to a non-linear control approach that I proposed was a so-called H2 optimal controller. So H2 optimal control is a norm optimal controller, which means that you try to minimize the norm of a specific transfer function. And what this controller is basically doing is it tries to, it tries to minimize the impact of some exogenous input, this could be for instance a disturbance, on a specified um, performance measure, which is here denoted with the signal Z. How could you derive such a controller? And there's actually a very elegant solution to this because you can write this uh, synthesis problem in form of linear matrix inequalities. And what was very important and what was very beneficial in terms of robustness was to actually use a multi-model uh, formulation of this optimization problem, which means that instead of synthesizing this controller gain for a specific operating point, you could actually use a complete set of operating points or you could use perturbations of a nominal model. And then when you solve this optimization problem, you, you can calculate a state feedback controller that will guarantee mathematically that your controller stabilizes your system at all of these operating conditions that were considered in this optimization problem. And that intrinsically captured a lot of captured variations in your state space models and led to a very uh, robust control solution later on. How could you verify such a controller now? So the main problem, and this is also the challenge of airborne wind, is that it's very difficult to verify that your controller is working in, in this uncertain environment. You have uncertainties coming from the wind, you have uncertainties coming from your simulation models for your, your time delays, et cetera. Teradynamics are very complicated uh, to consider in your controller. So it's very difficult to use, let's say, analytical stability proofs. Nevertheless, I choose a complementary approach based on, let's say, classical tools from linear robust control theory. For instance, I used mu analysis to calculate robust stability, robust stability properties of my controllers. But what was also very helpful were, was a more probabilistic assessment of the robustness of the controllers. And for that, I used Monte Carlo simulations. And in order to compare then my controllers, I used so-called quantile function plots. So quantile function plots are basically the inverse of a cumulative distribution function. And I calculated these distributions for specific metrics that were critical for a successful uh, pumping cycle operation. So one metric that was very important to me was, for instance, the maximum or the peak of the tether force during a pumping cycle. And you could then calculate these quantile function plots using Monte Carlo simulations. Additionally, you can use asymptotic confidence intervals to quantify variations, expected variations of the statistical experiment. 
And then you had, had, had the possibility to compare different control designs solely based on their statistical properties of violating or complying with you know, operational critical requirements, such as, for instance, the tether force peak. Very important also was to carry out then a sensitivity analysis and in order to investigate which uncertainties in my models were driving the failure probabilities. And one approach that I was um, pursuing and that I think was also quite successful was so-called uh, sensitivity analysis based on hypothesis testing. So in hypothesis testing, what you do is you specify a so-called null hypothesis, which means that you say in the beginning, for instance, in this application, that none of the uncertainties is influential with respect to some requirement. And then you use the results of a prior Monte Carlo simulation run and you identify all these uncertainties that led to a requirement violation or a combination of these requirements. For instance, here I said, identify all these all model uncertainties or uncertainty vectors that led in a simulation run, for instance, either to a um, violation of the maximum tether tension or a max or led to an angle of attack larger than the maximum angle of attack slash stall. And then you permutate these, these uh, uncertainty vectors by creating new test vectors where you basically flip a fair coin and you either choose an uncertainty or you don't choose an uncertainty and you end up with these uncertainty vectors consisting 50% out of zeros and 50% out of randomly selected uncertainties. And if you then do another Monte Carlo simulation run and you do a statistical significance test, you can then try to collect evidence that your null hypothesis is most likely not true. And then in this case, you would conclude that this, pro that this specific uncertainty is influential. I applied this to, for, in this case, identify uncertainties that were driving the tether rupture probability. And I think the uncertainty model consisted of 72 uncertainties. And by using this hypothesis test, I could reduce these 70 uncertainties to three uncertainties that were driving, that were mostly influencing this tether rupture probability. And more specifically, two force coefficient in set direction and roll damping were the most influential parameters in, for this specific um, case. Now, you could, what you could do, what do you do with this information? Well, you could now go back to your control design process and you could try to derive a controller with increased robustness towards variations in these parameters. Before you do that, of course, you should always check if your uh, sensitivity analysis was correct. And for instance, what you can do is you perform another Monte Carlo simulation run with new randomly sampled uncertainties, but you remove all the uncertainties on these influential parameters. And in this specific case, the, you see the quantile plot before you remove these uncertainties and this led to a requirement violation chance of 8.7%. And without these three uncertainties, actually the, uncertainty, the probability of violating this requirement was reduced by more than a factor of 100. And this was quite an interesting result and proved also that these three uncertainties are indeed the influential uncertainties for this specific requirement. All right, so coming to the last part of this talk, this will be mainly the uh, this is mainly the content also of the last chapter of my thesis, because once you have a controller that seems to work fine and you're happy with the robustness properties of these controllers, I was interested in trying to figure out, okay, how can I now generate conditions in which this controller is failing nonetheless? And how could you do this? Well, you could start again with a direct or slash naive Monte Carlo simulation approach. Um, for instance, here, for a simple problem, for a simple two-dimensional problem, using two random variables, theta one and theta two, which are Gaussian normally distributed. And what, what you would like to do is you would like to identify uncertainty combinations that lead to a failure. And in this case, hypothetically now, the failure condition will be defined to be any parameter combination that is above this, this red line, so in the right upper corner. So what you do with a Monte Carlo approach, you sample from the marginal distributions, and then you get a result that looks, for instance, like this. Now, you, you can see this is quite hopeless to try to uh, find samples in this failure domain. So without having to simulate thousands of, of simulation runs, which might be actually computationally quite expensive. So this seems not to be a reasonable approach. But there's 
recently some growing interest in using Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation approaches and in particular so-called algorithm called subset simulations. And what you do in subset simulations is you start with a um, simple Monte Carlo simulation run, but with fewer samples. And then you try successively to identify intermediate failure domains and you explore then your random state space based on these intermediate failure domains and you, you can then more systematically actually arrive at your failure uh, condition domain. It looks like gradient descent uh, kind of optimization. It's of course very different, but the idea is more or less the same. You are step by step um, walk towards this goal. And this allows you then to actually also populate this failure domain much more efficiently. What I then did is I tried to use these results in this failure domain to train a binary classification algorithm that could then use these counter examples to learn to predict these failure conditions before they actually occur and then trigger an avoidance maneuver to avoid this failure in the end. And I applied this specific algorithm to the case of a tether rupture. So you maybe recognize also the cover page of my dissertation. So what I did here is I was flying pumping cycles, sampling wind conditions where the control system was basically uh, becoming unstable and which would result in a tether rupture. And I was training then this prediction model using the results from the subset simulation model and was then able to predict beforehand the tether from rupturing. You can see this, for instance, at the, at the bottom right picture. So the orange dashed line, this is the case where the aircraft would basically crash because the tether breaks and, and the aircraft experiences a significant radial acceleration. And the blue line is the case where the avoidance maneuver is triggered and the tether would not rupture and the aircraft can continue its pumping cycle operation without having even to abort the pumping cycle or the traction phase in this case. And the, it, you could achieve this by a coordinated roll and pitch maneuver. And you see, for instance, at the top, in the top row, you see the tangential plane roll angle and the tangential plane pitch angle. And what the aircraft is doing, it's rotating into the tangential plane, which rotates the aerodynamic, um, the aerodynamic force vector into the tangential plane, which reduces the projection of the aerodynamic force in tether direction and therefore naturally decreases the tension in the tether. And this essentially allowed them to su uh, successfully avoid this tether uh, from rupturing. And one reason actually that could be identified why the tether was rupturing is that the winch acceleration limits um, were oscillating and yeah, the winch dynamics became unstable and then you can see they're jumping between plus and the, the, the positive and the negative acceleration limits and then at some point the, the tether just broke. And with the avoidance maneuver, the winch controller was keeping the acceleration in the positive limit, therefore reeling out the tether and hence avoiding the tether from rupturing. All right. This was a very sh a quick uh, presentation of the con content of my thesis. So uh, I think we are now ready for some questions and uh, some answers if, if I can give them to you. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Sebastian. Um, so we have now time for questions and answers. Uh, about 30 minutes are reserved. Um, maybe easiest, I mean, easiest is if you raise your hand, then I see that in Teams and I can basically then prioritize. I see here Uwe Fechner, um, who did the PhD in Delft before you. Sebastian has a few questions. I give the word to Uwe. Sure. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, so, <clears throat> I looked at your thesis, so my first question is, what was the objective of your controller? Did you try to optimize the harvested energy under given wind conditions and system limits? Yeah, so um, I didn't care about the power output uh, that much, so I did never try to uh, optimize my power output. And this was, uh, I did this on purpose because in my literature study, I realized that there was a lot of work already being done in this um, 
for power optimization and power curve optimization of air movement energy systems. So I wanted to write a dissertation in strong contrast to the existing literature by not focusing on power optimization, but rather on how to design controls that work in in, a, in various wind conditions, in turbulent wind conditions, in a stochastic environment, how to verify these robustness properties, or even how to quantify these robustness properties in various wind conditions. So that was roughly the main objective of this work. Okay, and in, in this context, which was your wind control strategy? On page yeah. 204 of your thesis, you show a fixed set point for the tether force. Yeah which is not good because it results in large variations of the output power and wind speed. Why did you choose this control strategy? Yeah, I want to, because for me, as I've seen uh, this in my prior, in my uh, first simulation runs, that it was very difficult to control the tether force or to achieve these requirements that I basically uh, defined myself, such that the tether force uh, states below its maximum limit. So, if you if you don't control the tether force actively, but you control, for instance, only the reading speed, the probabilities of a tether rupture was much much higher than if you would control the tether force um, actively. But I, I I realize, of course, that this uh, would be not optimal in terms of the power output. But again, this was not my objective. Can you, Sebastian, can you maybe unshare your screen? I think it's nicer to, to see everyone. Yeah. Just You can share it again if you need a specific slide. Sure, to figure out how to do that. <laughs> Just yeah, go to the menu, yeah. Good. Yeah, <clears throat> so, so because in my thesis, I suggested to keep a square root relationship between tether force and real out speed. And I think then, uh, yeah, it would you would have a much more quiet flight. And so the question for me is, are the results of your flight stability analysis valid if you choose such a non-optimal choice of force control? So if I would, I mean, in order to answer this question, what I would do, I cannot answer it now because you need to try it out. I mean, what I would do is, I would implement your control strategy and would run, let's say, 5,000 pumping cycles, calculate the distribution of the tether force peak and compare this then to my approach. And if your quantile function plot is below mine, then, then you won and your control strategy is not only more robust, but also more power optimal. And if not, then you have to decide on performance or robustness. <laughs> Yes, I, I would love to do this test. Uh, let's see if there is a possibility to do it. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe to to complement that, uh, what Sebastian explained, the source code of Sebastian's uh, uh, framework can be downloaded from the 4TU uh, repository. So all the software is available. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there other questions by the audience? Now is the opportunity to ask. So I have here a question from Andrea Iannelli. Mm -hmm. um, please just go ahead. Hello. Hi, Sebastian. Um, congratulations on the work. First thing, I really enjoyed your presentation and I learned many new things. I had a couple of curiosities regarding the robustness um, part, let's say, of your talk, which is quite a lot, but specifically on the first part, mm -hmm. where um, you mentioned that the H2 controller is uh, is quite robust. So I was wondering, is it a, a state feedback controller or you're doing output feedback there? State feedback. So you assume, and is it realistic to assume that you always have perfect state uh, measurement? I, I, I would say, you should, of course, also incorporate uh, the impact of measurement noise and, and the sensor dynamics, of course, um, which is a part that I neglected in my work. So um, what you would then need is, for instance, put a common filter in the loop to basically get the LQG, uh, because H2 norm optimal control is basically LQG control, right? Mm 
So, and then you need the Kalman filter, and then you probably lose some of the robustness uh, characteristic of uh, of the H2 norm optimal controller. Um, but this this is something that I did not uh, look into. Yeah, yeah, I was wondering because um, so yeah, the state feedback uh, H2 controller is very robust, but then when you go to output feedback, it suddenly becomes very vulnerable. And there is also a famous paper from Doyle saying yeah. that margins of uh, LQG and the abstract is known. So yeah. um, in that case, there has been a lot of uh, work on, uh, let's say, mixed H2, H infinity, for example, to recover some robustness. So I was wondering if that was an option you considered or uh, anyway, could be a further extension maybe. Yeah, uh, so um, I did not um, look myself into the combination of H infinity and H2 norm, but what I did was purely H infinity control. Um, sadly, I did not have the time to put that also in my work because it's very interesting and uh, to compare also the, the, the robustness properties is in particular if you look at output feedback. Um, yeah, so mm -hmm. that was still ongoing work that I could not finish, unfortunately, yeah. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, you presented a lot of things. So. Yeah. <laughs> the other curiosity was, in your opinion, does it make sense or does it buy you something if when you describe your model with a, an LTI through linearization, instead of considering LTI models, you would have LTV or LPV models capturing also variations yeah. of the, your system with time. Yeah, so um, that's another um, interesting um, further research direction, I would say LPV control, uh, because you have a lot of options. Once you have this possibility to, to actually linearize your system around your figure of eight, for instance, uh, you can schedule then your LPV controller over curvature, flight path curvature, for instance. Um, you could schedule it over tether force, you could schedule it over airspeed, whatever you like. Uh, so, uh, yeah, plenty of options and especially also very interesting would be, for instance, to look also into um, over-actuated systems that also consider structural dynamics. Um, I was also working a bit with uh, Urban Fasel on, on, on morphing wings, but unfortunately we could never really uh, finish this project. But um, I think this 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 approach of using linear flight controllers in combination then with with um, more sophisticated control strategies is, is still an, 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 a wide field, and I would definitely consider this to be an interesting research direction. Not so much the nonlinear control approaches, but really the the linear control approaches um, that you just mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, and and luckily there has been a lot of progress. Uh, on also robustness analysis techniques for LPV on a LTV system. So, I mean, it was very nice to see your results on mu analysis, which was a, a cornerstone result for LTI, but in parallel, there has been development on IQC and techniques that deal with the LPV and LTV system. So it could also be interesting to look at the robustness from that point of view and besides the control design. Exactly, yeah, indeed, yeah. Yeah, okay, thanks a lot, very nice work. Thank you. Uh, material for many more PhD dissertations, <laughs> it seems. Okay. Although okay. it's interesting, yeah, that uh, control is the the first real research subject that was brought uh, by airborne wind energy. It's like uh, that's the the field where it came into life. So we have here one more question by Dylan Eichelhoff from TU Delft. Please, Dylan, go ahead. Hi. Thank you. First of all, for the presentation. Um, sorry, I had to miss the first 10 minutes. So correct me if I'm going somewhere wrong in this question. Um, you know, I work more on the application as well. You know, I'm working with your controller yeah. on a larger power skill. Um, now I'm in doubt whether I actually have this robustness on this like tether force rupture um, prevention. So uh, like, what I'm wondering is if your like your um, your implementation here is very specific to the uh, tether dynamics you've been using during your research. Because when I changed the the tether model in this framework, I noticed that uh, at such a large scale, at least at the scale that I'm using, uh, these forces are so high that when you during your flight path have to transition between traction to retraction and back to traction you see that you get really high peaks in this tether force as the yeah the once you get sag in this tether yeah the dynamics between the two are like not really synchronous anymore and you see that when they straighten out you get high forces does this approach then also work uh, 
to prevent these phenomena or is it really specific to the lower skill and uh, the current more maybe more flexible tether than I'm using right now or elastic sorry tether yeah so um I mean since I know what the the, the yes. problem that you you are facing um I think the the main problem is that that you have a much bigger system, right? I think the wingspan of your system is 30 meters or even more, right? 42, actually. 42, yeah. yeah. So I think the wingspan of my system is around six meters, right? This is a huge difference. And and I don't really know if you can just, let's say blindly use the same control strategy for a system that is much, much bigger, right? Maybe um, even the, the strategy of flying figures of eight is not the right one. Maybe you, need to fly circles. Maybe you need to do a different retraction phase because I've seen also, for instance, optimizations where they are doing the retraction phase in the figure of eight itself. So you're flying one half of the figure eight out and the other half of the figure of eight you fly back in. Um, so, I mean, I, that's probably not feasible for you, but what I would do or what, what I have done would be to do an intermediate step. Maybe you don't, uh, Use a system with uh, 40 meters wingspan, but maybe only 20 meters wingspan, and see if you can then um, get better results for that. But in yeah, in general, it's it's hard for me to to answer this question. If this is possible, just to apply it and and tuning some parameters and make it work. No, I am I I understand that. Yes, for mm -hmm. sure. Um, then what I'm more wondering is like with the knowledge you gained during your PhD, then indeed, what would be your main recommendation let's say okay we maybe it's the best idea to go with an intermediate system okay but if we won't do that mm -hmm. you followed certain approaches to uh to get this robustness within your controller what would you then recommend to would you recommend following the same approach but then just on this system and see whether we can make the controller more robust for for this skill or would you say like we first going to evaluate other flight paths at all or like like what approach would you follow with the with the knowledge you have right now <laughs> so I, I have to answer your research question now though. <laughs> well technically not because i'm not going to follow i'm not going to work on controller uh, yeah. optimization or whatever so in the end yeah. it's not my research question but maybe for someone else yeah yeah so i mean th there was there was uh, for me it was a highly iterative process it 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 it. Uh, I went through a, a lot of uh, iterations to end up with this with this controller that worked in the end the best. Um, and I changed several times the the way I was doing the retraction phase. Um, it made a difference where I initiate the retraction phase, for instance. But I think you tried all these things already out. Right? You 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 tried to figure out uh, where to do the retraction. Should you do the retraction with a more shallow flight path or a more steeper flight path? And it, none of these apparently worked right so well we, kind of, you know, well, we have a working example right now mm -hmm. uh, so it does work eventually a bit slightly different than the retraction you did mm -hmm. but what i'm more curious actually about is not like how to get my system to work but more or less would it make sense to technically uh, because we're working on a different skill redo mm -hmm. all of your work or would you say like there's actually big parts of this that you don't have to redo we can start at some point and what point would that be yeah, so I mean the control structure definitely that you have now is one option. You have the nonlinear controller. You could of course also try to implement the linear controller, which is let's say uh, simpler in the sense that you don't have a lot of uh, parameters that you need to tweak. You don't need to choose the bandwidth of your reference filters, etc. You just need to uh, specify the operating conditions. But what could be also an option, I think, is that um, you use optimal control theory to, for instance, use calculate trajectories, um, do open loop optimization, so to say, to see what the optimizer mathematically would try to fly with your system, kind of getting a um, best, uh, best case solution, so to say, without looking at uncertainties, without looking at turbulence, just to see how would the flight path look like um, if you have such a big system, if you let an optimizer optimize the flight path? Mm -hmm. and, uh, because when I started working with this size of system, 
I knew already more or less how a pumping cycle should look like. So I knew already for this kind of system how the traction phase looks like, how the how the retraction phase should look like. But maybe for such large scale systems, this will look completely different. And if the result of the optimizer will will have a hard time to actually find a working flight path, well, then this would be a big problem because then then um, yeah. <laughs> mm. Then, then you need to be really creative what you can do with your system. And maybe your system is built in a way that it's, because this is maybe also something that's important. Sometimes you have fundamental limitations what a controller can achieve, right? Fundamental limit, like physical uh, axioms. You cannot do better than, because your system has certain characteristics. So if your system is designed in a way that it's super hard and super difficult to control, then the control engineer will have a very hard time actually finding something that will work. And figuring this out is very difficult because you're doing very nonlinear uh, flights and you have very nonlinear dynamics. You could, for a linear system, there are tools to, to test this, but for nonlinear system, it's difficult. So the only, let's say, approach that systematic approach would be to put this into an optimizer. And there are a lot of optimal control toolboxes also for airborne wind energy. Use your aerodynamic model, use your geometric characteristics and then use these optimal control toolboxes to get kind of an idea if this is even possible to fly in your system. Okay, makes total sense. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank um, you very much. And I think part of uh, what you explained is also what um, Dylan went through already. This <laughs> <I know>. search, <laughs> yes. Uh, it's, of course. It's, it's tough, it's hard. I mean, uh, I know you get crazy if, if, if it's not working and I know what you mean. <laughs> It's it's yeah. indeed like I did most of that indeed already, but there's it's still a lot for especially these flight paths. And when we move on on new research and going bigger, which is not just my research, but I guess in the future will be more people working on. Yeah. It's vital, like what would be where to start because you can't just do it all. You can't optimize everything. So indeed that was uh, yeah. a bit what I was looking for. But you mentioned a few of these points. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Yes, we have here one more question um, uh, by uh, Pepine Marcus from Kitebauer. Pepine, please go ahead. Uh, hey, Sebastian. Thanks for your presentation. Very interesting material. Um, yeah, excuse me if it's quite clear in your dissertation, but I, uh, I have not read it in a lot of detail. Uh, did you also compare your results against any data from real flights? To see how the uh, yeah how it compares to reality. So the model that I was using is is a model that is actually published uh, in a paper, which is actually based on on um, real flight test data. It's compared with real flight test data, and as far as I know, there was even some system identification performed to identify these aerodynamic uh, coefficients that I'm also using in my simulation. What I did not do, I did not test these control strategies on the real system, and I did not compare, therefore, them also not with reality. Yeah, yeah, that would be very hard, I guess, because then you would actually have to simulate some sort of tether rupture to uh, to do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Which, uh, which is a bit costly. But yeah. thanks for your answer. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah, I think I think this is a very good uh, point uh, that uh, Pepin just mentioned. Of course, nominal operation is something where we generally validate our physical models. Um, once we look at these um, anomalies, we we saw it in the diagrams that you showed. They occur very um, rarely, um, generally. So it's it's quite difficult to experimentally create that. Um, it took you great effort to to find a systematic way how you can computationally create these abnormal conditions. So that is for sure um, an area of research where we have only touched upon slightly. It will become more and more important, of course. Um, are there any other questions? I don't, yeah, I do see here Rodolfo mm -hmm. from University of Groningen. Please go ahead. Yeah, it's me. Uh, thanks for the nice presentation. So uh, I am not an expert in the topic, but in control, let's say a little bit more. I was wondering, uh, have you uh, studied any uh, control theoretic property of the nonlinear model? Because I, I have been reading your thesis and I see that you are always saying that linearizing about the point, uh, 
and also that maybe later you will go as well uh, only considering linear control techniques. But uh, there are, uh, let's say, papers that show that even a linear model can uh, perform better with a nonlinear controller. So I was wondering if you have studied, uh, let's say, the non uh, properties of your nonlinear model, and if you and why not a linear control, nonlinear control in your future research? Yeah. So um, I did actually start with nonlinear control, uh, and also. My second paper was a nonlinear controller, a dynamic inversion controller. And um, it turned actually out later on, and that's I think I analyzed this in depth in my dissertation, that the the nonlinear controller, first of all, it was very difficult to analytically um, describe robustness properties of the nonlinear controller. But on the other hand, the linear controller was very competitive, achieved competitive results, and sometimes in certain conditions, even better results than the nonlinear controller itself. And um, the, the main problem that I have with nonlinear control is that, first of all, analyzing stability properties and robustness properties is very difficult. I mean, you can use the Aponov uh, stability analysis to do this, but if you can, then you usually have to consider really the the complete nonlinearity of your problem. So you would need to consider the interaction between winch, tether dynamics, aircraft dynamics, the whole thing. And doing this analytically, I think it's just not possible or not feasible. So I wanted to try to figure out if this is also possible to control control the system with a linear controller, because this would make it easier to tune the controller, it would make it easier to analyze stability and robustness, etc. And in the end, if you compare the linear controller, which is just a matrix vector multiplication in the end is so much easier than using, a, for instance, an inversion-based controller where, have, where you have a lot of nonlinearities, it's computationally more expensive, etc. So, yeah, I, I understand. Actually, this inversion dynamics method in control, we call it the feedback linearization. Yeah. And indeed, there you have to cancel all, all the nonlinearities. But sometimes there are some nonlinearities that are, are actually good for stability. So, for yeah. instance, there are some approaches like passivity, in which you don't, uh, yeah, you use the energy to analyze the the passivity of the system. Uh, it, passivity it also has some optimal and robustness properties. So maybe that would be nice to check even with your uh, linearized model this kind of uh, approach. Yeah, um, I think at Delft you have people who are uh, good at this kind of topic. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your answer. You're welcome. Thank you.